לבדוק את המה. לפני שלוש שנים התארח אצלנו כאן באולפן רוברט לוי, וזה היה פשוט מהמם, הוא אלתר, אנחנו הוצאנו מהכובע פתקאות עם תווים, הוא מאלתר בחסד עליון, הוא יכול לאלתר פוגה, הוא יכול לאלתר סונטה. הוא בא אלינו כשופט לתחרות רובינשטיין, וקשה להאמין, אבל מאז עברו שלוש שנים ואנחנו בעוד תחרות רובינשטיין, ורוברט לוין הוא שוב איתנו כאן. שלום בוב, שלום רוברט. שלום. אבל הפעם הוא הביא איתו גם את החצי היפה שלו. שלום יפה. וולקאם. יפה. יפה. אתה מטייוואן. כן. ואני בטוח שיפה אומר משהו בצ'יינס. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> you are laughing already, I know why. I'm laughing because yeah. as soon as I arrived at the airport, yeah. the officer to take my passport and said, Yafe, do you know what this means? <laughs> so every day I hear this, it makes me happy. We know what it means in Hebrew. However, you are supposed to tell <laughs> us what it means in Chinese. I know that in China, every name must mean something, isn't it? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So, it actually means uh, gracious. graceful and talented. I guess my parents were hoping that that's the way I would turn out. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not too far away from the Hebrew, this, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. So I look at you and yeah. I look at your husband yeah. and I can fantasize the story. I can fantasize the plot. So there was a wunderkind in Taiwan a child prodigy, she was wonderful, pretty, and she played the piano marvelously. And all her life she had a dream. One day I shall go to Germany and study with a famous professor at the Hochschule in Freiburg. And then she came and studied with the famous Robert Levin. <laughs> and from this point, <laughs> you are supposed to continue. <laughs> well, that's, you summed it up pretty much. I mean... <laughs> Was I correct? Was... Close. <laughs> okay. Close. Close. Okay. So you studied with him for how many years? I studied with you for three years. <laughs> But actually, um, I went to Germany not knowing I would be as fortunate as to study with Bob later on. Uh, I went there as a child, so it took me a few years to um, wait until you finally arrive and study with you. Yeah. Um, you, you worked with Rosa, which was... Yes, with several wonderful teachers as well. Um, I suppose it is not so easy to be married with Bob from the point of view that he's a kind of a superman. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm very, very proud, if I may say so. And uh, I learn a lot constantly. So that for me is very easy. And um, we support each other, and I wish that I could travel with him even more, but I have my own work, so we, we do as we can. And we are going now to listen to the Brahms, which we pre-recorded and taped. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. It was really wonderful. Tell me, Bob, how many pianos do you have at home? We have three Steinways and a collection of period pianos. So she practices on the right-hand side of the apartment, and you? Yeah, we have two different rooms, far enough apart so we can work separately and together. But you have to meet, so there is a th that's why you have a third instrument for the that's, four hands. That's <laughs> okay. right. And then for the two pianos we have, and so it works very, very well. And uh, that's kind of a complication. Uh, for the forehands, because you are the famous professor. No, it's not a complication, because uh, Iafe is an artist of such refinement and imagination that she has at least as much to say as I, and I learned so much from her. And we heard it, and we heard it, and we are going now to listen to her playing on a separate basis of the Chopin preludes, which we pre-recorded. Which preludes are you going to play? B-flat major, B-flat minor. B-flat minor. Yes. You are serious. <laughs> the yes. B flat minor. Oh. Amazing. This is the most challenging one. You are very courageous.
Thank you very much, Yafe. That was really marvelous. Thank, Thank you. you. Toda raba, she she. <laughs> uh, Bob, you are here for the Rubinstein competition for the second time. Yes, it's a great honor to be here. Some impressions. I find the atmosphere this time incomparable. It is really, of all of the major competitions I have been uh, at, at as, as a juror, the warmest in terms of the feeling, the relationship with the jury. The, the Israeli public is absolutely extraordinary in its support and enthusiasm. It creates an atmosphere which is just marvelous. Do you feel that they try with the clubs uh, to influence the judges? Because for some people they do it more. Well, I think it reflects their own enthusiasm, which is the most important thing. And each of these contestants from so many places in the world will go home with Israel in their hearts to have received this extraordinary reaction. It's wonderful. You are one of the world's greatest experts for Mozart. <laughs> what is the question? My question is, what are you feeling about Mozart playing today at this competition? Because Mozart playing, as we know, is the most challenging and the most demanding. Well, my feeling is that one has to be very, very careful not to be too influenced by one's own sense of style or taste. Because the important thing is to recognize young musicians who have a commitment to this music and who express themselves through the music. And even if they do it in a way which is not the same as I might have read in some book somewhere, if they have this ability to glow in this music and communicate something emotionally persuasive, then to me that's much more important than how they play an ornament or whether they play on the beat or off the beat or all of these silly little things. But you are such a great expert for the style, for the embellishments, for the tempi, and there is a limit. It's not as simple as follow your heart. There is a kind of a borderline that you can say, so kann man Mozart nicht spielen. This is true, but it's true of all of the composers that we hear. But and Mozart is even more sensitive for that. I suppose he is. And again, for me, I am always trying to establish a boundary between what my own research has shown to be most likely how he would play and being intolerant because it's very very dangerous to absolutely say I this person cannot possibly advance because he did such and such and so and so you recorded Mozart on old keyboard instrument yes and also on Steinway I have some recordings also of Mozart on, on Steinway tell us more well, it's a wonderful thing for me to go back and forth because when you play, I have played on Mozart's piano many times. It's a special privilege. And you see these keys and you know he played all of these pieces for the first time. You are speechless. But it tells you the sounds he heard. And then you say, now how can I go to the Steinway, which I love, and try to keep the kinds of color and flavor of this instrument here. Because if I can transpose it, then my playing does not sacrifice any of the liveliness for the beauty of sound, which is the hallmark of the Steinway. And you are going to tell us more about Mozart and about your research and about your lacrimosa and about your requiem. But we would like to listen now to another pre-recorded piece that you did with Jaffe, and this will be the... Dvořák, the Slavonic dance number the, eight from the first The famous set. one. Yes. The very famous one.
changed Mozart's Requiem? I'm afraid I did, but it wasn't my idea. <laughs> I thought that this is almost like to prophesy the past. A <laughs> little bit it is, but Helmut Rilling did not leave me in peace for two years until I told him I would do it. Yeah, I heard this performance of Rilling conducting your, how to say, completion of the Requiem? I suppose it is, yes. Completion of the Requiem. Yeah. You even completed Lacrimosa, yes. which is maybe the most sacred piece of music we know. Yes, it is. And we, of course, we have the Sussmeyer completion. He was Mozart's assistant, and he got this job to do it. And uh, there have been modern attempts also to finish the Requiem. And I tried to recognize that people know Mozart through Sussmeyer, and I tried to keep as much of Sussmeyer as I could. Yeah, can you tell us more details in which situation it was composed? Why Mozart could not finish it himself? Well, he could not finish it because death stayed his hand. He was working very hard on Magic Flute and then on Clemenza di Tito. He started the Requiem, then he went to Prague for Clemenza. He came home and he got sick and he died. But it's important to know that Mozart was the kind of composer who had lots of music he was working on all of the time. There are 140 pieces of Mozart he didn't finish. And if he had a few more years, we would have had those pieces. Can you play for us the beginning of La Crimosa till the point that Mozart had to stop? Yes. It begins with the strings alone. Then no more strings and just the chorus. That's it. And how many bars he wrote from the beginning to the end? Also the strings and the voices, everything? Only two first bars and the strings, and then the choir and the bass line. So Nothing all this, tilam, tilam, that you completed it. Yes, everybody has to take this sighing figure yeah. and keep going with it. And every one of the completions does it differently. That's one of the things that sets mine apart a little bit because Sussmeyer does some things which are not so happy, I think. And so I try to clean them up a little bit. You have a little stain on your dress, you send it to the cleaners. But you never changed Mozart. You changed only no, what Sussmeyer did. No, only what Sussmeyer did, of course. Because we all know Lacrimosa. We recognize it the way it is. So you are not supposed to change too much what we love so much. But I didn't change too much. That's the point. Because I'll give you an example. What, what we have in the manuscript are two bars here after this. <laughs> This is not what we know. It was Eibler. He was the first person who tried. And then he said, I can't do this. I and Sussmeyer, he did, of course. Which seems to me, from the top, very good. But the bass line... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a waltz bass, yeah, and I, you, it, you have to do something about that. Uh, you see. Unanständig. It's una, yes, it's not respectable. Yeah, yeah, and so, respectable. so I tried to, to fix these things in as quiet a way as possible. Bob, I really hope you come for next Rubinstein competition in three years and you tell us more and more. But now our time is over and I would like you to play for us a kind of a surprise that you told me you prepared. And what is it? The surprise I have in mind is a prelude written by Henri Dutilleux, the great French composer, and it has a special connection here because it is dedicated to Arthur Rubinstein. And you knew, you have known Dutilleux? I have known him since 1979 when we met at Fontainebleau, where he gave some master classes in composition when I was teaching. And I then formulated the idea of recording all of his piano music. And finally, two years ago, the dream was realized. Yaffe plays with me the two piano piece Fantastic. on this record. Fantastic. And this, this piece, which is called D'Ombre et de Silence, of shadow and of silence, has an extraordinary atmosphere. And I think thinking of Rubinstein and thinking of Dutilleux, this is something for me special.
הרבה תודה ליפה, תודה רבה, הרבה תודה גם לבוב רוברט לוין, שהוא לבטח אחד מגדולי הפסנתרנים של דורנו, ואחד מגדולי החוקרים המוזיקולוגים שיש לנו היום.